بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ومولانا وحبيبنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا Again, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, I wanted to thank Rahma Foundation and the Jannah Institute, MCC East Bay, all of the organizers uh, for bringing us back together here again, alhamdulillah. After our last session, we had so uh, much positive feedback and it's really beautiful to see the community coming out again and of course those who are watching online. So alhamdulillah, this conversation, as Ustaz Fadwa mentioned, is a little different than our last conversation in that we're really dealing with contemporary issues, contemporary struggles. So I have the topic about this notion that women's roles and function in society have to do with how desirable they are. And we're going to break this down together, inshallah. Now, we did mention before, Sada Fadwa, that the content of this topic is obviously for um, a, a more mature audience. So if you have younger girls, I would ask you to please take them out, if you would, just for my comfort level and your comfort level and their comfort level. And then, inshallah, we can proceed. But I'll give you a moment to do that if you feel the need to do that. With that said, again, here is the description that we put out when we uh, gave you the, uh, the, the program details about this, um, this message. It's a toxic message, but it's a message that is found in every element of our, of our society. Uh, from a very young age, girls are taught to think of themselves in this form of, uh, of the, or, or focusing on the physical and focusing on on, on that part of who they are. And then of course, in our cultures and then in media, and we'll, we'll get to all of that. Um, but I really wanted to talk about this discussion. And what I'd like you to keep in mind is this beautiful quote that actually someone posted yesterday, of my um, a relative of mine on Instagram, and I thought it fit this perfectly. Because really, women have so much potential as we have already learned alhamdulillah with dr rania's beautiful talk and we will come to learn in in the other talks as well but we have so much potential it's usually the environments that we are in that prevent us from reaching that potential so i want you to keep this idea of you know of of how can we individually on an individual level also as a, as a community make these changes to the environment that we are subject to as women. And so with that said, we got to go back a little bit. So bear with me because this is going to be um, kind of like a women's studies class in a way. I'm going to take you on um, a little bit of a, a, a stroll through, through the past to get to where we are today to explain. Because again, as Dr. Rani beautifully said, context matters. So here's the history. It's so important that we as women know about this, these two major movements that happened almost simultaneously. And of course, I'm talking about the sexual revolution and the women's movement. And there's not enough time to go into all of the major things that unfolded during that very public uh, or, or politically um, intense time. But these are some of the highlights that I feel like all of us as women have to understand. So first, we want to look at the uh, you know the pill, and it's we should know obviously what that reference is. But when it was uh, manufactured and produced and became commercially available, and then also um, the timeline in terms of the political activism that was going on. Of course, we were in the midst of a war, and so there were a lot of um, this culture that was right here. And for those of us in the San Francisco Bay Area, right here in San Francisco in the Haight Ashbury district. There was this movement, and it was like a commune of people who basically came together with these very, very uh, different ideas. Let's just say, uh, about um, you know opposing war by by spreading love. But their ideas, of course, were perverse, and they uh, you know practiced a lot of things that um, that were just simply uh, haram on every level. But this was they caught national attention because there were a considerable amount of people flocking to San Francisco to be a part of this, right? Um, and I'm sure we all, we've all we all read or heard references to this in the past. But another really important person that we should know about is Betty Friedan, or Frieden, I don't know how to say her name, but Frieden maybe works. Um, she wrote The Feminine Mystique, and she was also the founder of the organization NOW, right? National Organization for Women. Now, look at her statement of purpose. And I think this is so important because we want to remember that a lot of the people in that time 
their intentions were good. They were good and well-intentioned people. They wanted to basically, you know, bring, as the statement says, right, women first and foremost are human beings to assert the humanity of women. So that was the biggest part of, of what the, why they, they were speaking out and actually, um, you know, pushing back and, and to give women the chance to develop their fullest human potential. So you can see that that is something, of course, all of us, if we can just put ourselves in that time, we would probably all want to be a part of a movement like that, that was saying, yes, we're human beings, we deserve rights, we, have, we deserve human rights. So in many ways that was the platform, but things changed. And so why did they change? Now this event is really important. This happened on November 18th, and this was in the Chinese room of the Mayflower Hotel. So the now basically had their second annual conference. And look at the amount of women that attended, 105 women. That's less than what we have here, 105 women. And they came together to go over the Bill of Rights, which was part of their charter, and they wanted to really you know, organize themselves. So in addition to the founder, Betty Friedan, there was another woman, her, Margaret Rowalt, and she's looking at her age, 72 years old, much older, uh, much more conservative, and she was appointed by JFK to uh, lead the Commission on the Status of Women. So she also had a very important role, and they were coming together, joint forces, to really, again, advance the cause for women. However, in, the, uh, in that meeting, uh, Frieden, she basically kind of pretty much uh, surprised and shocked everyone in attendance, especially Margaret Rowalt, because while they were there to vote on different matters, the very last vote that she saved was on abortion. And that was very divisive, uh, divisive. The, the crowd completely was divided. You had very conservative women in that room, like Rowalt, and then others who were more liberal. And Frieden, though, had a reputation. She was referred to as being someone so frightening that she was uh, all of the witches of Macbeth in one person. That's what some people said about her. So she was a very a force to be reckoned with. But she basically got the vote to swing in her way to push for a repeal of all laws that had to do with abortion. And this was something Rowalt was not happy about, so it, it, was, it caused a big problem. Now, two days later, what does she do? She decides to hold a press conference. Remember, 105 women, only I think, what was it, 57 women that voted? Um, 57 to 14. 57 women voted for abortion laws to be repealed, but she goes in front of a national, you know, she's, this is a press conference, and she speaks on behalf of 28 million American women and says that this is what we want. We want abortion laws to be repealed. This was a huge moment in this country because the conversation around this topic that before then was very taboo um, was suddenly changing and shifting. And of course, as media does, they're going to pounce on sensational news. So the conversation starts to change. The rhetoric around you know, female sexuality, sexual practices, uh, health care, all of these things, abortion start to really change, right? And then not too long after, you know, um, in 1973, of course, we have Roe versus Wade. Now, Betty Friedan was interviewed in 2001, and again, this quote is important. She says, ideologically, I was never for abortion. Motherhood is a value to me, and even today, abortion is not. I believed passionately in 1967, I believed passionately in 1967, as I do today, that women should have the right of chosen motherhood. For me, the matter of choice has never been primarily the choice of abortion, but that you can choose to be a mother. This, that is as important as any right written into the Constitution. So she was not pushing really for abortion, she was pu pushing for the, for the choice, right? But I don't think she may have realized, Allah knows, the consequences of what she did because they were severe. And what I mean by that is, again, the introduction of a repeal on abortion law changed every, the, the attitude, the culture uh, around these topics, and we saw in, in 1963, a few years after the pill was introduced, right, 2.3 million women taking it, single women started taking it because they could what? Have more sexual freedom. They could start doing things without the consequences of an unwanted uh, a pregnancy. And married women could limit their family size. So all of this matters because we have to ask questions, right, about how did we get to this place now? Well, all of these things are changing the way that our societies was, was previously structured. It starts to shift everything, right? And so then we have in 19. 64, this is a major Supreme Court ruling that this book, Henry Miller's book, uh, Tropic of Cancer, was not considered obscene 
when that you know, ruling was, was implemented, then what happens? It opens the floodgates for more and more books, magazines, movies, to begin to start to refer to and start showing more salacious, more sexual content. And of course, at the center of that is going to be women. The debates, of course, have continued ever since for decades on all of these topics, from birth control, abortion, homosexuality, marriage, and divorce, pornography, all of these things started to just become mainstream topics that were debated between, of course, the, uh, the conservative uh, right and the liberal left. And that's continued uh, up until today and continues to be something of debate. 35% of, of births today, uh, FYI, are from unmarried women. So we can see a huge, again, shift because of all of these things. And of course, the steps, um, I mean, we, we should note all of these, uh, these things. So now, let's get to some facts that, again, we should all know, especially if, you have, uh, if you're a mother and you have daughters. Um, it's so important that we know this. But the exploitation of female sexuality, again, as all of these changes were happening so rapidly, the advertisers and people in the film and movie ind industry, the entertainment industry, of course, seized the opportunity, right? People are, are, it's not as taboo as it was. I'm not gonna get canceled, right? At that time, uh, they had a similar idea, concept of cancel culture. You couldn't speak on certain things without consequences, but suddenly those consequences were removed. So now it's about profitability. It's about making profits, right? So the, as, as they realize that there is immense profitability in exploiting and objectifying women, they began to do that. For decades after, the industry practice was to do what? And you can see this, I shared actually with uh, Sada Fadwa uh, um, a, a link yesterday that was so disturbing to look because it was someone who had basically collated all of the these ads over how many decades that showed the objectification of women, men, uh, everything. But it was just really disturbing to see the the, the, the massive amount of, of uh, you know, these types of imagery that we've been subjected to that we may not even realize. But dismembered ads are something that we should know because I, I remember I watched, uh, and I'll, I'll get to that in a moment, but it can make, a, when you start to see it or understand the, the definition of these things, that you'll start to notice it and it's going to affect you. But what, what is a dismembered ad? When you take a woman and completely, um, you know, parse her into pieces, she's no longer a human being that you feature to, you know, in whatever advertising you do, you just look at her as body parts. So an arm here, a leg here, uh, you know, mouth here, other obviously parts uh, as well. Um, but that was just industry practice. So we saw it in print media, billboard, commercials, selling everyday products, toothpaste, right? A woman has to be completely almost half naked to sell toothpaste. But this is why, because again, there was profitability in that. And so women became objects, playthings, Prizes. This is what was standard. And then, of course, the subliminal messages, right, of these, uh, the non-existent ideal image of femininity, uh, which continues to pervade this, these unrealistic, filtered, and digitally manipulated images, of course, which have gotten even better as technology has advanced. But they're plastered everywhere. So we, as young girls, whether we know it or not, we're, we're seeing these things. You go to a, a store, a children's toy store, you can see images. And we'll get to, again, the targeted campaign uh, on little girls in a moment. But everywhere we look, we see these images in print, film, television, social media. And so as a result, and look at the statistic, this is so horrific. It is so horrific to think that in one year, a child, grade school children, could take in as many, 80, as, many as 80 thousand sexy girl portrayals. Watching what? Not adult television, kid targeted TV programming. They know what they're doing. They want to get inside our head. They want to break us down. They want to reduce us to nothing but a physical object that they can then use and manipulate however they want. And they do it at a very young age. And of course, the consequences are devastating. The APA um, in 2007 reported that uh, the sexualization of girls in the media is far more than the sexual uh, than, than boys, right? Girls were of, often featured in revealing clothing, as well as with bodily postures and facial expressions. Again, young girls, we're not talking about you know, girls of age, young girls that imply sexual readiness. So they are being told to pose in, in ways 
that invite that. And of course, you, you know, you can see that everywhere now in this culture if you're looking at um, children's programming, but also, as I said, just going through the aisles of a store like Target, you'll see even the way that sometimes the girls, the posters for girls' clothing or other things, the way that they're positioned, it's very inappropriate. Um, and further studies that, again, show how uh, widespread this problem is. 58 different magazines, uh, according to this uh, study, had more than 50% of their advertisements were featured as sex objects women were. And then in men's magazines, 76% of the time they're, they're being objectified. Um, just again, you can look at the, 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 the numbers here, but it's just devastating. And then down here at the bottom, the American Journal of Psychiatry um, this now has to do with social media because we're again we're bringing it we're, we're kind of moving through the timeline here right we talked about the movements and then the print media and all of the the changes that were happening rapidly now with social media we have uh, much more more devastating problems in the fact that in the sense that these devices are in our children's hands for nine hours or more a day and they're being bombarded with this type of imagery and uh, again 10 to 50, 25 percent of adolescents who were surveyed in this particular study had sent sex. If you don't know what that is, you should know that term, right? Because we have text messages, and then there are sext messages, which are sexually reference uh, text messages that are either you know with words or images depicting something of a sexual content. So almost a quarter of our youth are receiving and sending this type of um, uh, messages. It should really awake us. And here we see again the devastating effects it has on young teen girls, right? 80% of women, first of all, uh, say that the images of seeing other women on television and in movies, fashion magazines, and advertising makes them feel insecure. So 80% of us, let's just be honest, we've all been impacted. And if you think you haven't, I don't know, maybe you're Allah's protected you completely, but at some point in our lives, we've probably done a comparison. We've probably watched something and felt really ugly, right? I feel like, oh, my gut is too big. My this is too big. After watching, you know, someone else, this is what 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 is exactly intended to happen. They want to break us down, right? Because it's all about the the, the, the physical. Forty-two percent of girls, first uh, through third grade, want to be thinner. First through third grade. How many of you here have first graders? Anybody have a first grader, a second grader, a third grader? Can you imagine that they're talking about dieting in that age? They're not out there playing. They're talking about wanting to be thinner. Audhu billah. 81% of 10-year-old uh, girls are afraid of being fat, right? How did that happen, right? How did it, we come to a point in society where that word is even, you know, is into this, again, a concern of children that young, that 81% of girls are afraid of that, subhanAllah. And then, you know, these are comparisons about the average uh, girl is 5'4", but the model that's presented to us is the average height is 5'11". So the ideals presented to us, they're thinner, they're taller, they're obviously photoshopped, they're, uh, they're, they're, they don't, that's not true, you know, uh, image of, of uh, I mean, oftentimes, um, of what they even look like but yet we do this comparison. And then with young girls who are bombarded with this type of imagery, how is it affecting them? They're feeling lonely, depressed, anxious, lack of confidence, right? Um, and, and so it's, it's clearly a problem that we need to be aware of. Now this is, the, um, this is a really important, if you've never watched this, please, and if you have young girls, especially if you have teenage girls, Please watch this with them. I watched this in college, and this was probably one of the, I remember it, it was very transforming to watch this uh, documentary. Jean Kilborn, for four decades, has been researching the exploitation of women in media, and she has an amazing uh, series that she's done every decade, subhanAllah, where she just goes, and she'll pull up ads to show. You, you think this is all, um, you know, we're just making it up? It's real, and it's getting into our minds, because when you're passively watching television or film, you're not always aware of what you're taking in. But if it, it's, there's enough of a stream of it, and it's constant enough, it will start to break you down and make you feel bad about yourself. So, <laughs> excuse me, so... Um, definitely check this uh, documentary out, and I think she even has it free, like it's on YouTube. 
So what is the mechanism that these advertisers use? Well, it's pretty simple, right? Attractive bodies are employed, so they find these models, they find these subjects, so that they can grab people's attention and then simulate what? Desire. So it's like, oh, and women, we, we have to, you know, that there's desire of a sexual nature that obviously men would feel, but for women, it's that desire to be like what we see on the screen. So it is desire. That is the impulse. That is what they're tapping into, right? And so, you know, and then they hope, obviously, that that desire will transfer to the product that they're selling. So, you know, as they say, buy the beer, get the girl. In this way, women's bodies are equated with commodities presented as rewards of consumption, right? And so here's some examples. And again, this was from that website that I mentioned. Um, just look here. This is a dismembered ad, right? We don't see a full body in, in the first two here. We just see legs. I mean, that's just terrible. And we shouldn't look at this like, oh, it's no big deal. No, it is a big deal, especially when you look at the psychological effect and the ramifications of this type of messaging from a very young age on girls. And we wonder why we have an epidemic of, of, uh, and a crisis of eating disorders and other problems. It's because of these types of messages that get into our minds, right? And then look at this. This is a beer ad, right, Michelob? She's She is the bottle. She's not even a human anymore. Let's just forget her humanity. Let's just infuse her into a beer bottle. That's how desperate they are to get female, you know, uh, uh, consumers to buy their and male consumers. Obviously, they're targeting men, but still, you know, look at that. And then ha, I don't know about you guys. Have you ever jumped on a car with like 30 of your homegirls and done a picture like that? I, I don't know, Mafadwa. Are we missing out on something? Uh, how unrealistic and ridiculous is that image? It's just. So ridiculous, right? But we will just pass it by, you know, looking at an artist instead of being angered. Like, why? Why do we have to, you know, spread ourselves on a car? I mean, are we, is it, I don't know about you. Yeah, I've, I've never met anybody who's loved their car that much to, <laughs> to do that. You know, and this poor woman at the bottom here with her dog, I mean, the dog got more show time than she did. Her ankles were all that mattered here. Let's just hide her behind some wallpaper. I don't know what that is. Fabric. But let's feature her dog. Her dog is important. I mean, this is the kind of stuff that should, again, anger us. Like, why, why are we okay with this? And going back to, you know, the now's charter, like, really what happened to the humanity of women? If this is what we're dealing with now. And this poor woman, I mean, she's got beautiful teeth, no doubt. But what about her eye? I want to see the rest of her. Why are you teasing me with just her face and, I mean, smile and nose? Why isn't she, you know? This is, these are the types of things that are subliminal, but they get into our psyche, and we should just, again, um, be angered by these things, not look at them like, oh, what nice lipstick. No, that's, where's the rest of her, right? Exploiting the female consumer, right? $500 billion industry, the, the, the beauty industry. Individually, $313 per month women spend on beauty products creams, lotions, makeup. And that's not to say that we can't beautify ourselves, which we'll get to. But just think about why. Do you see men, you know, I mean, I, I just saw yesterday, I noticed there's a Sephora and there's Ulta and there's just so many makeup stores. I'm like, you know, they're everywhere. They're really in almost every shopping center. Where are the men's, like, I don't see men having a store about beautification, like just for them. But we, we need it, apparently, so we're so desperately, you know, unattractive that we need a store pretty much in every shopping center. It's just tragic. And in a lifetime, $225,000 you're spending on beauty products. The procedures, cosmetic. You know, I was thinking, I saw a video the other day of this dentist who, she was making uh, TikToks to try to save women from doing what? Running a, or getting on a flight to Turkey, which is now a popular destination where they are doing what? Any dentists here? I think I would be so mortified as, as if I was a part of you know, that industry to see people, what they do. They shave their teeth down right to get the caps. You see it? These are young girls, sometimes in their 20s. So as soon as they you know, hit 19, 20, it's like your teeth aren't even good enough. My God, what's left? What is left? That we have to shave down the teeth Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us, which are such a blessing. I mean, you can talk to any medical practitioner. They'll tell you dental health, dental hygiene is related to overall health. And if you have good teeth, even if you don't think they're nice, say, alhamdulillah wa shukr lillah. I have my own teeth. But these poor girls are being conditioned to think, nope, they got to get rid of them. Because if they don't look like chiclets in your mouth, you don't have nice teeth. 
right? Like you just gotta have a set of chick. I mean, I don't know, again, how we got to this point where we had bought into this, right? Or, um, you know, other countries, did you know the number, what is the number one country in the world for rhinoplasty? Iran, that's a Muslim country. So there are people, right, you know, I mean, in our own communities, maybe in our own families who are, again, so impacted by these messages that, um, that, that our own countries are now offering these services, subhanAllah. Now, the biggest target of the U.S. cosmetic industry is millennials right now. So if you're a millennial, age 18 to 34, they're coming after you. You're the target, right? Because some of us who are on the older side, we're over it. I'm over it. I'm over heels. I'm over lipstick. I'm over all of it, right? <laughs> exactly. I'm over it. But those of you in the younger generation, they're coming after you. So they're, they're the, you're the ones that they're going to tell you need, you, everything's wrong with you. Nothing is good enough. Nothing. Right? Nothing. Astaghfirullah. So please watch out. And then what's really ironic, and this is actually tragic too, we have to feel sorry for these people. Because when you see Hollywood and you see these actors and these actresses and these singers who are just being used in every... And yes, they've made a devil's bargain likely uh, in, to, in order to be in that industry. We can say that. But they're still being exploited. 94% of women employed in that industry have been victims of some form of sexual harassment. That is shocking to me. That is shocking to me that they're still willing to be in an industry where they will report actual harassment on levels that are so troublesome. I mean, stuff a lot, you know, it's one thing to have an inappropriate joke, but look at, if you go down the list of this, um, propositioned for a sexual act or relationship, can you imagine staying in a job being propositioned inappropriately by someone? How many, I mean, most people who are, you know, thinking would be like, I, I don't need that job, right? Or to have, uh, you know, being, uh, if you go further down here, being forced to do a, a sexual act. 21% of the women were forced to do something. It's just tragic. So we shouldn't, you know, look down on them. We should feel sorry that they are so, again, uh, being so manipulated to think that they have to subject themselves to these things that they're willing to do that. But also we should be aware of how much it's affected women. Because if you look at this list here, right, um, this is the top artists that sing about sex and love. I, I looked at it and I was like, Safra, right away, look at it, Lady Gaga. I don't know SZA who that is. Lizzo, Whitney Houston, Beyonce. These are women. And then on the right side in the text, you'll find who got in 2021. She was prized, what a great prize, to have the most sexual references in her songs. Nicki Minaj, right? 43 direct inferences to sex in one song. On a, and then, um, of course, two years ago, or almost two years ago, I'm sure you guys remember, it was all over the news, you couldn't escape it, but there was a song that came out, it broke records, it broke records, many records, for the biggest 24-hour debut, and then also on YouTube, 55 million views in a week, and this was, of course, the terrible song, Awadu Billah, by Cardi B and Megan The Stallion. Um, I don't want to go into that, but just enough, this, this critique at the bottom is enough for you to know about this song. It's degrading and disempowering to women due to its sexually explicit lyrics and overt sexualization of women's bodies. So these are all realities, and our youth are, are, are you know, watching this content. I work with youth. I know they're listening to these. I've had literally classes with, and sessions with youth where they admit that these are the people that they're listening to. In our homes, in our Muslim homes, these are the musicians that are you know, that our, our young girls are memorizing their lyrics. And what are they talking about? And then, you know, this is the genres that we also need to be aware of. Um, and this, I thought, quote was really good. This was from, uh, you know, he was the, the, the president of this uh, Delamere Health that put this study together. But he said, music industry in many ways glamorizes and glorifies drug, drugs and alcohol use. Uh, drugs, and al drugs, alcohol, and sex within lyrics is something that can be influential on the behavior of children and teenagers. 
Just like adults, they begin to relate to the artists and situations in personal ways. That's really important. So it's not just that it's entertaining. They start to see themselves in relation to who they're listening to, to who they're watching to. So when you have a young, again, 12, 13, 14 year old girl listening to this stuff, she's going to start comparing and contrasting and thinking, well, I'm not good enough because I don't look like, again, uh, Cardi B or Nicki Minaj or what have you. The evidence is, there's ample evidence, there's, it's undeniable, right? To conclude that the sexualization of girls has negative effects in a variety of domains. We're gonna just quickly go through these. Cognitive and emotional consequences. It, you know, sexualization and objectification undermines a girl's confidence, and it also um, it causes problems emotionally, right, and self-image problems by increasing shame and anxiety. Mental and physical health consequences. We have eating disorders, low self-esteem, depression, depressed mood, and then um, as well as negative consequences to sexual development, right, that they can't develop a healthy sexual self-image. So really important content. I know it was a lot, but there's still a little bit more to go, so bear with me. But these terms we have to know and we have to teach our children and at appropriate levels so that they're aware of what they are and how to define them. What is sexualization, right? It's the act of endowing with sexual characteristics or of excessively emphasizing those characteristics in the real world. And then here the APA says that sexualization occurs when any of these four aspects occur. One, a person's value derives solely from sexual behavior or sex appeal, including any other characteristics. So when you have, again, women being told that they have to look a certain way, they have to dress a certain way, because that's all that they have to offer, that is sexualization. A person is held to narrowly defined standard that equates physical attractiveness with being sexy. So again, it's, all, it's so important to know these definitions. Um, and then a person's objectified um, because they're valued only for others' sexual use, right? And how many broken hearts do we have of young girls who are taught that unless they perform, unless they do certain things, they have no value? This is the peer pressure of this modern age, right? Our age, some of us who are in the Gen X or older was maybe drugs, maybe, you know, doing something rebellious. Now it's, uh, you need to prove your, uh, whether or not you're, you're, you know, sexually available is where you get your worth from. And if you're not doing those things, you're not considered worthy. So clearly all of these things are happening. And then sexual objectif objectification is the reduction of a woman to her body, body parts, or sexual function. In other words, we have nothing else to offer. And this is, again, everywhere you see this. And it's a form of oppression, right? To be treated as a body or a collection of body parts. We're only valued, again, for our use of, or consumption by others. So forget, you know, our our needs, as long as we're, you know, pleasing other people, that's all that matters. And this is detrimental to a person's what? Self-concept of humanity. So when you have this message enough, you start to forget your humanity, you forget the other aspects of yourself. And this is why we have a crisis that we have with so many young girls in this society. Um, and then the word desire, we're gonna go back to this point. What is being desired really means for women? Look at the key words in the definitions of desire as a, a verb, a noun, and then desirable as an adjective. I just pulled out some of the key words. Is this what we want for our young girls? That this is what we see ourselves? That, that we are a craving? I don't wanna be anybody's craving. No, thank you. Uh, that all we are is an object, right? Um, and and our, own, our only purpose is to bring about lust and desire. But this is what that word desire and being desirable in this society means, right? So then how can we understand and define desire in a healthy way? So let's take back and reclaim what, what healthy desire is because this is a toxic message and none of us need to ascribe to it. Of course, we don't need to look any further than our theme. So simple, right? That's it, the, the presentation's over. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but all the answers, alhamdulillah, are in our deen. The Prophet ﷺ reminds us, Verily, Allah does not look at your appearance or wealth, but rather He looks at your hearts and actions. This was for all men and women. Stop hyper-focusing on your external. It is about the inward, inward beautification. Verily, among what I fear most for you are seductive, temptations in your stomachs and passions and the misguidance of whims. So he's telling us he feared that we would fall into these things where our whims and desires and lusts and the, the need to be desired by others will preoccupy us. And if he feared that for us, we should fear that for ourselves. 
Verily, every religion has a character, and the character of Islam is modesty. Love this. Islam is modesty. This isn't the domain of only women. This is the domain of every believer. Very important message. Women in Islam, of course, we're honored, right? The natural aspects of us are honored without compromising the essential. It is possible to do that. What does that mean? Our bodies and souls, like that of men, are created primarily to worship their creator. And the form of the woman, women's physical form, in every aspect, psychological, intellectual, physiological, biological, emotional, sexual, is positively acknowledged and recognized in Islam. Positively. There are other faith traditions that make negative associations with those things. In our deen, they're all positively acknowledged and recognized. Women's rights, including sexual rights, are clearly stipulated and upheld in Islam. Our existence and value in society is indisputable in Islam. It's not even a question of debate. Our safety and security from all harm, all forms of external harm, must be guaranteed at every level of society. The objective of every man and woman in Islam is the same, to worship their creator and live righteously in obedience to Allah. Both men and women in Islam are taught to struggle against their lower self, the nafs, that part of us that pulls us into desire, right? To suppress ideas, impulses, and thoughts that lead to illicit desires and actions. Both of us are told to control that part of us, right? Both male and female sexuality and sexual desire is viewed as natural, healthy, and something to be enjoyed when explored within the boundaries of a lawful marriage between a husband and wife. And both men and women in Islam must guard their chastity and live according to the guidelines of Islam, which strictly emphasizes modesty in word, action, dress, and behavior for all. This is so beautiful. Did you know that there is a verse in the Quran that was revealed? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not forgotten us. He never has, but this is so, so beautiful, right? That he's defending a single woman from the inappropriate gaze of men through this verse. Right? This is chapter 15, verse 24. We surely know who comes first among you, and we surely know who comes last. So according to Ibn Abbas, he said that a woman was so beautiful, she would come to the masjid, she would pray behind the Prophet wasallam. She was very beautiful. Everybody acknowledged her beauty. Some men, because they had what? Taqwa. They had that fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They would come and they would go to the first row so they wouldn't be... Uh, you know, look at her. Others, however, would come so that they could be in the last row. Why? So that they would, would, they would go into sajda, what would they do? They would peek through. Can you imagine? I'm sure we've all, we all those of us who have children, we've seen our, our children's sajda, right? Where it's not the, the forehead, it's the top of the head. Can you imagine grown men, a'udhu billah, on the top of their head, trying to get a peek at a sister because she's so beautiful. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this ayah to defend her. So we should all think about this. That this He's telling us, right? He's obviously teaching the men here, but also for us as women, that we shouldn't seek to be desired that way by anybody. We shouldn't seek, I mean, other than our spouses, obviously, but we shouldn't seek that to be looked at, Right? in that way, which is what the society tells us to do. Be beautiful, go out there, put yourself out there. If you got it, flaunt it. We need to reject that. No, if you have it, protect it. Not if you got it, flaunt it, please. Exactly, exactly, mashallah. Now, because, and I have to credit Asada Fadwa, because she told me, you gotta put something in about this, because you know you're gonna get some pushback. Of course, beautification in Islam is important. It's not to say we completely leave that and let ourselves go. No, it's highly encouraged in Islam as a practice of what? First and foremost, gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for one's blessings. Because the body is a blessing. It is a blessing to have health and well-being. And so you take care of it, right? Maintaining cleanliness and hygiene and then following the prophetic example. So here, all these hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, Verily, Allah is beautiful and He loves beauty. He loves the loftiest of affairs and disapproves of pettiness, as Dr. Rania beautifully reminded us. Let go of the pettiness. Allah does not love the pettiness, right? 
The Prophet ﷺ said that no one with an ounce of arrogance in his heart will enter paradise. Now, in seeking to understand, remember, mashallah, the, the Sahaba were always, you know, they wanted clarity. They asked about what, what arrogance means, and they said, Oh, Prophet of Allah, what if a person likes to dress well? Okay, so for those who are into fashion, don't misread what I'm talking about. He answered that question. Again, Allah is beautiful, and he loves beauty. Arrogance is rejecting truth and looking down on people. So when you put on your nice outfit and your nice clothes, don't get ahead of yourself and start to think of yourself as better than anyone. If Allah has given you jamal, you have beauty, you have clear skin, don't look down on people who have unclear skin, right? This is the message that whatever uh, you know, blessing you've been given, see it as a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, honor it, but also don't you know, see yourself above anyone because he could take it from you just as quickly as he gave it to you. And so that's what we, uh, when we mention these things, but of course we can dress nice and we can, we should look presentable, right? And then cleanliness, we should all be aware of these things. We should teach our children from a young age to be mindful of keeping themselves clean and pure, practicing good hygiene, making sure that all of the areas that need to be taken care of before they come into public spaces are taken care of, right? So checking their smells. I, I have two boys. One of them is in, hitting the teenage years. As soon as he steps out the door, my question you can ask him is, did you put deodorant on? Did you put, you know, some what we call khushbu and for the Urdu speakers, right, which is like a perfume or a cologne or something. Because I don't want them to, I want them to follow the sunnah, and I don't want them to offend people. We should teach this. And I can't tell you, as someone who does coming-of-age talks, I've had multiple requests from parents and teachers alike to say, please address this with the teens. Because we're failing our kids. We don't let them, we're, we're not doing a good job of this. It's a very uh, serious problem. I don't know why, but some of our, our youth are just not really taking care of their cleanliness. So we have to be on top of them about these things to follow the sunnah. And the Prophet ﷺ said, the people of paradise will enter paradise with smooth and hairless skin. So no more waxing and shaving, ladies. We've got a lot of things to look forward to, inshallah. <laughs> natural kohal. Don't go get tattoos and all of that. Don't do that. We'll get the natural kohal in our eyes in Jannah, inshallah. And we'll be that ripe age of 30 or 33 years of age, inshallah, bi and then the last one here, um, love this, right? This is from Ibn Abbas. He said, verily, I love to beautify myself for my wife, just as I love for her to be beautify herself for me. Due to the saying of Allah Almighty, they have rights similar to those over them. Beautiful balance of our deen. Both are responsible to take care of one another. This is not just the burden of women to, to kill ourselves trying to look beautiful for our spouses while they let themselves go. Our, our you know, we, we need to go back to this, right? And then, of course, real beautif beautification is sourced from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and directed inwardly, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, surely we have created the human being in the finest stature. And the Prophet sallallahu said, this is his dua. Oh Allah, make what is within me better than my outward appearance and make my outward appearance righteous. Oh Allah, I ask you for the righteousness of what you give to the people of property, family, and children without being misguided or misguiding others. So that was his dua, it should be our dua, that we want our inward beauty to be better than whatever outward beauty we have, right? And he also said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves to see the effects of his grace upon his servant, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He loves to see that when he's given us blessings that we show them, but we show them with what? With refinement, dignity, gratitude. We don't show them with boasting and arrogance. We don't mimic what we see in this toxic culture that pits women against women, where you see a woman entering a space and she just, all her brand names are out and she thinks she's above everyone else. We don't do that. If you have blessings, of course you can share them, show them, but do it with them, that mindset that this is a, my way of showing gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not arrogating myself and presenting myself to people. The Prophet ﷺ said, gentleness is not in something except that it adorns it. So that's an adornment that we need to all know. To be gentle, to be soft, to be kind in our words and our actions. That's real beautification, right? No amount of lip filler is going to you know, make your lips beautiful if you have a toxic tongue. right? You can go and inject all you want and get all the Botox you want. But if you have you know, these character flaws, that's what we need to work on. And then Ibn al-Qayyim, may Allah be pleased with him, said, and it is enough to realize Allah's beauty when we know that every internal and external beauty in this life 
and the next are created by him. So what of the beauty of their creator? That's the beauty that we should seek. Here are some ayat for you if you wanted to screenshot these. Are, but these are all reminders for all of us. And, his, and, and of his signs is that he created for you from yourselves mates that you may find tranquility in them and he placed between you affection and mercy. Indeed, in that are signs of the people who give thought. So this is how we as women should, again, see ourselves, right? Um, and in this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's honored us in ways that I think some of us may not have yet realized. But inshallah, may Allah open our eyes to the fact that he mentions us in this way, right? Separates us from the men. So that aim, I go back to that, um, you know, the, the now, their mission that they wanted to bring forth the, or remind people of the humanity of women. Well, here, what's more uh, a proof th uh, than this, right? Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Lord the heaven, of, of the heavens and the universe is telling us, right, who we are and what we should aspire to. So I love this ayah, but even um, Leslie Hazelton, she acknowledged that this is really remarkable in that comparing it with the Bible, she said the Bible exclusively addresses men, right? Um, using the second and third person masculine, whereas the Quran here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is addressing women directly. So that is him elevating us. That is him honoring us. And this is, again, what we should aspire to. So in summary, sisters, and I'm done. Don't be seduced by the sinister and evil propaganda of Western culture and media that mean, manipulates girls and women to ascribe to a distorted, dehumanized, and destructive understanding of themselves. Women in Islam are honored for their entire being and not devalued for any part of our creation or their creation. By overemphasizing beauty, beautification, and sexuality, women may inadvertently deny their more essential purpose, the beautification of the soul, developing beautiful character, and striving for the pleasure of Allah and that worldly delights. And we must learn to nurture all of the gifts and blessings, right? Our intellects, relationships, talents, skills, interests, hobbies that Allah has given in order to find true fulfillment, not just focusing on the outward. So I'll leave you with this last slide. Remember, if anything's missing in your life, look around in the environment and make those changes. And then inshallah, you will come to bloom because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us all of the means to do so. It's in our hands to change what needs to be changed, inshallah. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you.